הפרופסור, פרופסור אורית חזן, היא זה פרופסור את טכניון, Israel Institute of Technology. She's at the Department of Education in Technology and Science. Uh, she, she already published a book uh, by the name Human Aspects of Software Engineering, and there is another book coming uh, about Agile Software Engineering. Uh, she has more than 100 uh, publications, and she is also a friend and a colleague of mine at the Technion, and I am pleased to welcome Orit to give her talk uh, entitled Human Aspects of Software Engineering, Social and Cognitive Perspectives. Please, Orit. Good morning. Thank you for attending this talk. Um, thank you, Michiel, for inviting me. Um, I'm going to talk about human aspects of agile software engineering. And as you will see, one of the main ideas that I will advocate is collaboration. And I just want to mention at the beginning that my talk is based on my joint work with many people. Yael Dubinsky, Jim Tomeiko, Oweel Iron, Irit Adar, Tali Steger, and Meira Levy. Uh, just, just to know, to make, um, to become familiar with you. Who is uh, familiar with agile software development? Okay, okay. And who is familiar with uh, the following problems of software projects? Who is familiar? Good, okay. So we are on a very safe uh, ground. And the idea that I will try to uh, present today the work and assumption will be that software is an intangible product. And as such a product, it raises, it faces us with many problems that part of them we can see here. And what I will try to show you that agile software development tries to overcome these difficulties by doing two things. The first one is to increase the, soft, the process transparency because if software is an intangible product, we can't feel it, we can't see it, we it's harder to communicate it, so agile software development tries to increase the process transparency. And the second idea is that, once again, because software is an intangible product, it tries to reduce the, s the cognitive complexity because it's harder to understand something which is intangible. So agile software development in a very systematic way reduces the cognitive complexity and we will see it uh, later in our in the next 15 minutes. I will talk about three topics, collaboration, abstraction, and testing. I'm not sure that I will have time for all of them, but um, I will try to uh, go over as much as we have time. Um, I didn't know if you're familiar with uh, Agile Software Development, so you're familiar with the Agile Manifesto? Okay, you will get the idea. Um, and with the good results of Agile projects, that it does many good uh, things to software projects, it uh, increases the business IT alignment, it accelerates time to market, enhances software quality, improves team morale, increases productivity, and helps to manage uh, requirement priorities. So you can see that many people, many people, it is based on a survey that was done with about uh, several thousand uh, practitioners, they, most of them uh, declared that they got better results with agile software development with these respects. So this is a um, background, and let's start with the first part, which is about collaboration. And I would like to present to you the following scenario. Okay, you are a team. Okay, for this purpose, you will be a team. And you are told by your manager, by your team leader, I don't know the system here, but you are told by someone here in the hierarchy that if you will done, complete the project on time, within budget, on high quality, high quality, you will get a bonus. Okay, the entire team will get a bonus. And you are requested um, among the team to make a decision how to allocate the bonus. And you are given five options. The first one the, it means that 
the total bonus, 100% of the bonus, will be allocated equally among the team members. Okay? The second option means that 20 percentages of the bonus will be allocated according to the personal contribution to the project success, and 80 percentages of the, of the bonus will be allocated equally among the team members. Okay, and we can proceed with all these options, and this means the opposite, that 80 percentages will be allocated according to the personal contribution, and 20 percentages will be allocated equally, etc. And now take 10 seconds, no more, no one needs more, 10 seconds to decide which option would you prefer. Yes. See. Okay, why? Okay, thank you. It says C. Other opinions? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, now uh, you're right. It depends on many factors. It depends on how big the bonus is, because if it's $10, we really don't care. You know, it depends on... Uh, the uh, skills of uh, the team members. It depends on many uh, issues, but try to think about the general um, situation, okay? And um, uh, if you can think about the general situation, what would you prefer? Okay, so all the team, all the bonus will be allocated equally among the team members, okay? Did you face any uh, conflict when you think about it? Can someone tell us about the conflict? Okay, we'll proceed. Um, first of all, in all audience, in all cases that I present this uh, um, uh, problem, and um, people prefer that a bigger portion of the bonus will be allocated to the team rather than on a ba personal basis. It's crossover, Israel, the US, anywhere. And um, um, another phenomenon that uh, um, happens all the time is that people have conflict between the interest of the team and their personal uh, interest. And uh, we will connect it in a minute to the fact that software is the intangible product. And what we will do in the next uh, 15 minutes or so, we'll try to explain this conflict uh, by game theory. Uh, very briefly, game theory is a field, is a mathematical field, that tries to explain how people behave in situations that are characterized as games are. So, for example, uh, there are several players. Uh, each player is influenced by the behavior of the other players and uh, each one wants to maximize his or her profit. Okay, so we will try to understand this conflict um, between the personal interest and the team interest with game theory. Within game theory, we will use uh, one framework which is called the prisoner's dilemma. Are you familiar with it? Okay, and so once again in one sentence, the prisoner dilemma is uh, um, analysis framework which tries to explain how people behave in situations in which they cannot verify that their cooperation is reciprocated, okay? And it happens in, a, for example, when you cannot coordinate it with other people, you are isolated. There are many, uh, many situations that you cannot verify whether if you cooperate, your cooperation will be reciprocated. So um, I'll just give you the hint at this stage that because software is an intangible product, it's sometimes hard to verify that your cooperation is reciprocated. And you can go in your mind and find scenarios that you couldn't uh, verify this. So let's um, present it very briefly, the uh, prisoner's dilemma. Um, it originally came from a situation that, is, is, uh, that happens in a prison. There are two prisoners, they are isolated, and they should uh, decide how to behave uh, um, uh, in the following situation. The police uh, tries to find evidence against them. And uh, the police puts them in two different cells. They're isolated, they cannot uh, communicate. 
and um, in the very simplest uh, form, they play one turn, and in this term, they should decide between two uh, options, whether to cooperate with each other, with each other, it's important, the co cooperation is between them, or to compete, that means that do not co uh, collaborate with each other, okay? And this um, table describes uh, from A's perspective what happens uh, in each case. So let's try, uh, let's um, st uh, start with this cell, okay? A cooperates, As, uh, I'm sorry, A competes, okay? A competes, B cooperates. It, me it means that um, A provides to the police evidence against B. Okay, so now the police has some evidence against B. B will go to the jail and A will be released because the police doesn't have any evidence against him or her because A, B cooperated with A. Okay, it's clear? So this uh, is a very good uh, situation for A, that A competes, B cooperates, A gets the best results. This cell is exactly the opposite, exactly the opposite because uh, A uh, cooperates, A cooperates, it means that he doesn't provide the uh, police any evidence against B. B uh, competes, it means that he does, he or she does um, uh, provide evidence against A to the police and A will go to the prison, B will be released and it's very bad for A. a. We are looking here at the table from A's perspective. So far it's okay? Okay. Let's look at these um, uh, cell. They are both compete. They both compete. And that means that they give, both of them give to the police evidence against each other, okay? And it because the uh, police uh, would like to thank them for the evidence that they, they provide, uh, the punishment is decreased, it's reduced, but still there are evidence, so they get zero. Th zero is a relative uh, sum, it's not absolute. Okay, and what happens in a situation in which they both cooperate? They do not provide to the police evidence. They do not provide to the police evidence, so the, po the police cannot accuse them, and they are both released, but why is it better than this? Because there is no evidence to the police, so it's a better situation for them than this one, okay? So this is a, a payoff uh, table, and now if you were A, according to this table, and think about, uh, uh, consider the fact that you cannot, you cannot verify what B is going to do, because you are isolated, okay? This is one of the very important working assumptions of the prisoner's dilemma, that you cannot coordinate how you behave according to the uh, other player. So, uh, what would you do? Yes? So, if you were A, what would you do? Okay, you see it? It's very clear because if you are uh, A, if B cooperates, if B cooperates, it's better for you to compete. And if B uh, competes, once again, it's better for you to uh, compete. Now remember that B will do the same uh, calculation, okay? And he or she also uh, will compete because they do not have a way to verify it. And notice that if they both cooperate, it will be better th for them than to uh, compete, okay? Because five, it's bigger than zero. So if they could coordinate their behavior, they should um, uh, co uh, cooperate. But because they cannot coordinate their uh, active uh, behavior, they will compete. And they will get very bad results, right? Okay, so this is a prisoner's dilemma. And now let's return to the uh, bonus case, okay? Um, we return to the bonus uh, situation. 
And once again, you are, uh, will think about a smaller team, only two people, A and B. And in software development, there are many ways that you can um, present as cooperation and uh, as competition. For example, uh, if I am on the team and uh, testing is uh, good testing to integrate only uh, well-tested code, it means to cooperate. If I integrate a code which is not well-tested, it means that I compete. Okay, and you can think about many, many um, forms of cooperation and uh, competition in software development. So let's see what happens. Um, uh, I am Yechiel on the team. I will be A, Yechiel will be B. It will be B. And assume that both of us um, cooperate. We test our code very well. We integrate only very well tested code. And at the end, our um, personal contribution will be considered as equal, more or less, right? So we'll get, remember the first problem, we'll get about 50 percentages of the bonus, both of us. Now assume that uh, I compete at Yechiel, uh, tests his code very well, he integrates only very well tested the code, and I let myself to compete, not to test all the, all the code, and, um, but because I will compete, I can produce a lot of code because I do not test it, I can uh, proceed. In the long term, it will harm us, but on the short term, it, I will be perceived as doing more work because uh, from the outside I will do more and more and will not test it just a moment. And so at the end, at the end to the one outsider and we clean many working assumptions once again, okay? Let's uh, think about it theoretically. At the end, uh, it will, Yechiel's contribution will be considered smaller than mine because I do, did a lot of code. He he, he tested all the code, so he proceeded slowly. So I will get 80 percentages of the code, and he will get 20 percentages. Okay, this is a reverse situation. When Yechiel will get uh, 80 percentages, I will get 20. And let's see to the at, uh, let's look at this cell at this time. If we both of us will not test our code, if both of us will not test our code. It makes sense that we will not be able to complete it, to complete to complete the co the the project, and you remember the conditions to get the bonus. You should complete the uh, project on time, on high quality. So in this case, if both of us will compete, we will not get a bonus at all. So it's a very bad situation, and we will get zero. Now, if you look at this table, what is the difference between this table and the previous one of the prisoner's dilemma? with respect to the relative values. I will remind you, okay? Um, this was the original one. And this is the uh, software one. Excuse me? Yeah. You're right, but think about the relative values. Okay, they're only illustrative. I could put here uh, um, to raise all of them by 20. So none of them were 10. Uh, okay? You see? Right. Right. In this case, in this case, uh, in no matter what B does, for A, it would be better to compete. Okay. Now, in software project, and this is what I suggest, is that uh, in this case, in this case, because it's s uh, smaller than this one, so what it means here that in software projects, in software projects. Partial cooperation is bigger than 
no cooperation at all, okay? Because in these situations that only one cooperates, they will get at least something, okay? From if um, we can uh, return to the first working assumption that each one is evaluated according to his or her contribution. So in software projects, partial cooperation is better than um, no cooperation at all, and it is different than the prisoner's dilemma. So, but let's put it now in the wider context. Um, I would like to emphasize, first of all, that uh, the prisoner's dilemma is not something theoretically. It's how people behave in situations in which they cannot verify that co their cooperation is reciprocated. It's human nature. You cannot change it. Your, our tendency, our human tendency, is to compete in such situation. Uh, if, in, if when we know that if we cooperate, we'll get better results. So this is um, absolute. We cannot change it. Um, now let's see what goes on in software projects. Uh, in software projects, people are asked, developers, engineers, are asked to cooperate because if it will produce good uh, um, results. However, because software is intangible, and we now we connect it to the prisoner dilemma, because software is an intangible product, it's very hard to verify that our cooperation is reciprocated. Once again, because software is an intangible product, it's sometimes hard, harder to verify that our cooperation is reciprocated. So it brings us back to the situation of the prisoner's dilemma. But as we just saw in software projects, in software projects, competition of all partners lead, leads to the worst results. So we have a conflict here because on the one hand we know that um, we it's not so easy to verify that our cooperation is reciprocated. On the other hand, we know we, we know that this is a, a software world that if we do not cooperate, we'll get very bad results. And now I would like to move to the next stage and to explain how agile software development tries to overcome these uh, obstacles of software projects. So the just recall that the prisoner's dilemma, the source of the prisoner's dilemma, is that the um, prisoners could not could not coordinate their activities. Be so in, in pro software projects, it is reflected by the fact that software is an intangible product. So sometimes we cannot verify that we our colleagues behave in the same way. So what I suggest, agile software development does it vanishes the, un the inability to verify that cooperation is reciprocated by increasing the process transparency. And in such a way, it vanishes the working assumption of the prisoner's dilemma and the conflict, the conflict, the, prison the dilemma, or the prisoner's dilemma doesn't exist anymore. And because you are familiar with agile software development, I will just mention several agile practices to illustrate how agile software development increases the software transparency. First of all, the whole team. The whole team, if uh, you know agile software development, the team sits in one office, in one space, and the whole walls are um, dedicated to post all the information that is needed for the uh, project measures, the assignments, the, the user stories, the progress, the daily progress, everything is presented on the walls. So everyone knows what uh, goes on and um, what is the project status. The second one is the daily stand-up meetings. If every day I as a team member should report on what I did yesterday and what I'm going to do today, I increase the software, the process transparency. And if all of us do it. All the team does it every day. It increases the, soft, the process transparency uh, very clearly. Okay, you cannot hide anymore. You cannot hide anymore. Um, you cannot compete anymore. Uh, another practice that helps us to uh, increase the software transparency is the uh, planning sessions, because in the planning sessions, unlike in traditional software development uh, processes, uh, all team members participate. 
So it, it's not that you just got, uh, get something from someone else. They participate, they hear the, uh, the customer, uh, they can ask him or her questions, and it's very transparent. All these requirement uh, phase measures. I mentioned it before. Measures are measures are posted around, and everyone can see, including management, including the customer, can see how the project proceeds. And finally, once again, the customer. The customer involves all the time in the process, so nothing should be hidden. Okay. So this is how agile software development increases the process transparency in order to vanish the working consumption of the prisoner's dilemma that, um, and to enable, to lead people to cooperate. Because if they could not verify that the cooperation is returned, they would tend to compete because the prisoner's dilemma is our human nature. Okay? So this is the first part. It's about um, how agile software development increases software and transparency. And if you want to think about it more, you can um, think about the following questions. Uh, maybe other software development methods can be analyzed in a similar way. And maybe uh, other theories from game theory, from behavioral sciences, from other fields can help us in understanding how to improve Software process, uh, software processes. Okay, we are moving to the next part. It's about abstraction, um, and I would like to ask you, what is common to the four uh, uh, following statements? I will read them. The first one is, I, I need a I need to gain a global view of the application in order to know how this method fits into it. The second one is, I truly believe that if I had a minute to think about these two objects more abstractly, I'd have come up with the con conclusion that they can be extracted into one class. But I must move on to the next development task. Okay, this is the second one. The third one is, uh, I need some time to think about the code without being swamped with all the details. I'm almost sure that if I could leave now and go to swim, I could have come up with a solution. But I must stay late as all the others on my team. And the last one is, I wish I could join the programmer when she or he writes the code. You ask why, I'm not sure if this design can be implemented into C++. Okay, what is common to all of them? There are excuses, right? <laughs> why? Why, why people have felt the need to uh, explain their behaviors, yes? Okay, mm -hmm. very local, very on low level, right, okay. Okay, so let's just highlight these uh, four, um, the four parts in the, uh, that highlight this uh, uh, view that result in excuses. Uh, the first one said, uh, I need to gain a global view. I need to gain a global view. The second one said, I, um, I, I, ha uh, I would prefer to have uh, two minutes to think about it uh, more abstractly. The third one said, I'm being swamped with all these details. And the last one uh, talked about uh, implementation, code implementation. And uh, these are all these terms together, and once again there is a uh, tension between very low level of abstraction and high level of abstraction. And let's see how agile software development is expressed with this respect, how we can improve our understanding of about agile software development with this respect. Let's uh, think first on a traditional development process, okay? It starts with requirement and requirement analysis, and it goes to design, and then it proceeds to uh, detailed design, and then to coding, and then to testing, and as you can see that we reduce the level of abstraction from each phase. This is one uh, characteristic of um, traditional development processes. Uh, the second one, the second characteristic is that usually each activity is performed by different people. 
So people are exposed only to one level of abstraction of the entire product. And remember, we started with the learning consumption that software is an intangible product. It's hard to understand it. We should assist the developers, the entire team, in the development process. And one means that I suggest, and I'm not going on into all the psychology now, that in order to help them to improve the understanding of the software product, they should have uh, they should gain um, a view of the product on different levels of abstraction. Okay, not to get the specifications from another team and just to code and to be remained only on a very low level of abstraction, but rather to move between levels of abstraction in order to improve their understanding. It reduces the cognitive complexity because software is an intangible uh, product. So let's look at these several um, practices that guide uh, very nicely uh, agile teams to move between levels of abstraction. So first of all, the planning sessions that, are, uh, that, take, uh, that take place uh, at, the at the beginning of each release and at the beginning of each uh, iteration. And if the iterations are really small, they are of one or two weeks. Uh, so first, then the release is longer, is about two months. So first of all, the release planning session uh, takes place on high level of abstraction, relative high level of abstraction. Then uh, when we go to the iteration planning session, we reduce the level of abstraction. So if this is a timeline, the project timeline, we start here with the release planning. It's a on a high level of abstraction. We move down to the iteration planning session. It's one day at the beginning of the iteration. Then we go down during the iteration to the code level, nine days, nine development days. Then for the next iteration, we go once again, on we increase the level of abstraction, then go down, et cetera, et cetera, till the uh, release ends, and we start again. We go, we increase the level of abstraction, and uh, we move between the all these levels. Uh, another aspect of the planning session that uh, helps us to move between abstraction level is the fact that the entire team participate in the, um, the planning session. So all the team members have both the high level of abstraction and the, the, local lev the lower level, level of abstraction when they code. So they are aware, they know uh, from where uh, each, requirement, uh, each requirement arrives. Uh, the fact that we talk about short releases uh, it means that we are not staying too long on the same level of abstraction. Each time we should change the level of abstraction on how we look at the software. Pair programming is another practice that helps us to move between levels of abstraction because if I am the um, driver, if I am the driver, I am on the low level of abstraction. The navigator who sits next to the driver things on higher level of abstraction. Uh, the last uh, practice is refactoring. There are more, but they last for now, because uh, if you do refactoring in order to know how to redesign your code, in order to uh, improve your code, you should look at the code from a higher level of abstraction and then to uh, go back to the code and to reduce the level of abstraction. And what is nice is that because refactoring uh, uh, edge of software development legitimizes refactoring. It's okay to do it. People do it. In other development processes, sometimes people who want to improve the code are just told, don't do that, proceed to the next development um, task. So um, this was the second illustration of how edge of software development uh, tries to help to cope with um, the intangibility of uh, software, and while the first one about the collaboration showed how we, um, uh, how agile software development increases the process transparency, this uh, illustration shows how agile software development reduces the cognitive complexity by leading people to think on different levels of abstraction. Um, the third one is about testing, and here it's a mix. We will see once again. We'll see how the agile style of testing helps, on the one hand, to increase um, a process transparency, and on the other hand, to reduce the cognitive complexity. 
So I just want to start by um, uh, presenting several arguments why people do not like testing in the traditional way it is carried out in many traditional software projects. Okay, the first one is that uh, in traditional development processes, testing is carried out at the end um, of the process. And in many, in many cases, it is done under pressure. So people do not like to be under pressure, so they sometimes, in many cases, they just uh, skip it. And we can look uh, at a quote that describes the situation. Uh, it is taken from uh, Hans van Liet, it's one of the famous uh, software engineering textbooks, and it says, the testing activity often does not get the attention it deserves. By the time the software has been written, we are often pressed for time, which does not encourage thorough testing. Postponing test activities for too long is one of the most severe mistakes often made in software development projects. This postponement makes testing a rather costly affair, and yet in this book, after the acknowledgement, is, which is very important, this book does present testing as one of the um, last activities in the development process. Uh, observation two, and we try to understand now, now why traditional testing is not encouraging so much. Uh, testing give, uh, may give uh, negative feedback. Think about what testing is. You write code, and now you should find bugs in your code. You should find what is wrong in your code. Not a good feeling, and uh, it ends uh, with failure. Uh, let's read the red box, okay, which reflects the idea that I just mentioned. Maybe the reason testing is not always thought of, of as fun is, is, that, is that there is a flip side. The program may not work. In the earlier parts of development, things can be go wrong, but failures are not as absolute as graphic and graphic as they are in testing. A developer can even unconsciously or on purpose sweep problems under the rug during requirements, specification, design, and coding. But when those problems show up as failed tests, it's no longer possible to kid yourself. So it's really not a nice uh, feeling. Third observation why f people do not like traditional testing is that uh, they really don't care because y in many cases it is uh, transfer the code is given to another department, the QA department, and if it's not my responsibility, the code quality is not my respons responsibility, I will tend to skip a test and I will not dedicate the needed time. The fourth observation is that uh, testing as it is done in traditional development processes is uh, an activity that takes place at the end of the development process. It takes place at the end of the development process. And if we think about traditional other assembly lines or other factories, of other kind of uh, producing um, products, when it comes to the end of the production line, the status of the worker is reduced because the first one are the one who designed the product and then the people do um, more technical jobs which are not considered to be on a high uh, status. And if once again, if we leave testing at the end of the process, the people who do uh, testing are not, um, uh, do not get high status. And let's see the results of one uh, um, study. It is taken from the communication of the ACM, and you can go and read the entire uh, study. Though most organizations recognize the need for high-quality testers and their speci speci specialized skill te set, testers still struggle to win the respect they deserve. One manager told us, if you had a diagram with code at the top, the engineers, developers, would put them th themselves above that. Many testers feel they struggle to maintain their place relative to that of developers. And uh, finally, the lack of status and support makes the testers' job more difficult and time-consuming, as the struggle for recognition becomes part of the job itself. So if this is a status that testers get, no one would want to do testing. Uh, and there are other 
pro uh, problems with uh, testing. Uh, from the managerial perspective, sometimes it is argued that testing slows down the development. It sometimes it, uh, it is a claim that it's hard to manage uh, testing. Cognitive dif uh, difficulties, remember we talked about it before. It's hard to know what to test, how to test, how many to test, etc., etc. So, so far we talked about the problems with traditional testing, and I would like to suggest that agile software development helps us to uh, overcome these problems by doing two things. Increase the process transparency and reduce the cognitive co complexity. And just want to make sure that we talk on the, uh, um, uh, we have in mind the same concept for test-driven development. That development, uh, when I say uh, test-driven development, TDD, I mean automatic tests, which are written prior to the talk, uh, prior to the code, okay? Automatic tests, which are written before the code is written. And you know J unit, I'm sure you know, and with the red and green bar, bar. you know? Okay, so let's uh, go one by one on all the problems that I just mentioned, and we'll try to see how TDD helps us to cope with these problems. Uh, time pressure is eliminated in agile software development because you do testing all the time, so it is not left to the end of the, of the process, and you do not skip it because there is nothing to skip. Uh, testing gives negative feedback as it is done traditionally, but if you look at how um, testing is done in uh, TDD is done, you will see that you just reverse the, um, the actions. You start with a failure because you write a test that fails because you haven't written the code yet, so it fails. But then you write the code and the test runs. So it ends with a success and I would like to present a um, testimony of a practitioner. It is taken from the wiki of uh, Agile Software Development. It is uh, accessible to everyone. Uh, so it starts like this. Why don't people like testing? Where the traditional way of testing is tough to take. You write what seems to be perfectly sensible code, then you write a test and the test tells you that you failed. No one wants to hear that. Let's return it around. Write the test first. Run it. Of course it fails. You haven't written the code under test yet. Start writing code. Keep testing. Soon the test will tell you that you have succeeded. Okay? Very good feeling to end with a success. Um, the second, the next argument was about that the, the responsibility is transferred to some other department, but here it is not transferred because each developer, each engineer tests his or her code, so no responsibility can be transferred. Low status of testers, it vanishes also because all test, all developers do testing, they test their own uh, code. From the managerial perspective, uh, we know, we have evidence now that, um, and we saw at the beginning the results of Agile project, that Agile software development, uh, which includes uh, testing, TDD, in most cases improves, accelerates the time to market, and it is partial, it can be partially explained by the fact that tests are automatic. So if you think all the regression tests, it's very easy to do them because they are automatic. Um, it's hard to manage testing, once again, it's very easy, it's very clear when you write the tests. You write them before you start um, uh, implementation, implementation of a specific requirement. Let's see how it is reflected from the same um, wiki. It's a wonderful experience. I don't write code any other anymore. anymore. My code has less problems, I have more confidence, and this is from the managerial perspective, and management has more confidence. Cognitive difficulties. Once again, we return to uh, cognitive. Remember, we uh, the cognitive perspective. You, we want to reduce the cognitive complexity. So let's see how TDD does it. Because uh, in TDD, each time we test, we write the test for a very specific, very small uh, unit. We should not think about a huge chunk of uh, code. So it enable us to face a small problem each time, and it's very easy to know 
what to test because it's what I'm going to write next, the next line, the next function, the next method. It's very easy to know what I should test. And how much testing should be performed, it's also very easy because I write the test for what I'm going to develop. Very easy to know. Let's see how it is reflected in uh, a practitioner, John Ron Jeffries. A key aspect of this process of TDD, don't try to implement two things at a time. Don't try to fix two things at a time. That means reduce the cognitive complexity. Just do one. When you get this right, development turns into a very pleasant cycle of testing, seeing a simple thing to fix, fixing it, testing, getting positive feedbacks, feedback all the way, guaranteed flow. And you go so fast, try it, you will like it. Okay, so let's conclude with the um, third part of testing, which was about uh, how uh, the problems that uh, traditional testing uh, um, challenges us with, and how TDD helps us to cope with these uh, problems by, uh, in many ways, but particularly by reducing the cognitive complexity, and in some sense also to increase the process transparency. So, if you have to take one message from all these uh, illustrations and cognitive perspective and managerial and process transparency, I would suggest to take the fact that when we think about our processes, development processes, we should think about the fact that software is an intangible product. And as such a product, it raises many problems that we should encounter in a very systematic way and to solve the typical problems. I suggest two uh, mechanisms. One is to increase the process transparency, and the second one is to reduce the cognitive complexity. Not easy tasks, but doable. So I'm done now, and I will be happy to take questions. So what do you think are the best examples of uh, the studies or, or the best ways to illustrate the value of agile processes? And do you think there's some work to be done there in finding better ways to demonstrate this using actual data, uh, studies, graphs, whatever, as, a, as the sales part of this? You look for data. You want data. I would think that would be a good way to provide hard data. Okay, um, you know that uh, agile software development is a relative new approach. It's not; it's uh, new like Google, I guess, more or less. <laughs> so there is data, but not well established as traditional uh, processes have. Uh, but you can look at the um, um, conference uh, proceedings of the conferences and find some uh, uh, data. I have a paper in. Um, IEEE software about testing and how it influences the project. It was a huge project in the Israeli Air Force and it uh, made many changes. It, it improved the process, it, uh, it, um, it affected confidence, which is very important. It influenced the customer's relationship with the uh, team and uh, there is data not as much as traditional processes have at this stage. But you can come to the conferences and see how practitioners talk about development, agile development processes. And not only the practitioners, but also customers come to these um, conferences because they understand that maybe in other shops they will get a better service than the one they get currently. So they come to the um, uh, uh, conferences. Um, some people um, uh, say that uh, that companies that will not move, uh, change in some way the uh, development processes will, uh, you know what is those disruptive technology? You know what it is? It's a technology that at the beginning sometimes people tend to uh, ignore. And when sometimes it, um, pe when they keep ignoring it and at the end they are left behind because they didn't uh, join the wave. But uh, Maybe we are too early to know exactly. Okay, there are um, two main conferences. There, are there is one in the North America that takes place in the summer. Ne this year it will be in August in Toronto. And there is one in uh, Europe each year. Uh, 
the next one will be in Ireland, if I'm not wrong, or Madrid, Ireland. It will be in June. So these are the main two conferences. The one in the U in, the in North America, each year it doubles uh, the audience. Last year there were it was in uh, Washington DC, and there was about 1,200. Next year, in now in Toronto, it is expected to have uh, 2,000. It's a big uh, move. The North American one is called the uh, Agile uh, Conference, Agile 2008 now, okay? Just Google it, Toronto, and you'll f Google it. I forgot where I am. <laughs> Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.